All right, and while you're turning there, we're going to pray. Father, bless these words. Bless this message. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to try to tie three things together today. First thing is the two characteristics about God's nature. And the second thing is when we struggle to just be Christians, you know, to live up to things according to the word. We all struggle with this, you know. Not, nobody here is exempt, all right. And thirdly, when that happens, we need to look on to who Jesus Christ is. All right, so first we're going to start in 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. All right, you may be seated, all right? So we're going to start off today talking about two of God's characteristics, his nature, all right? And uh, they're, they're really, it's not that they're unique, but to me they're fundamental, all right, in who we are and how God has just, just given us who he is. When we accept the Christ, he's in us. And as we read this word and we grow in this word, we become that nature, right? In John 3.30, it says that we must decrease and God must increase in our lives. His nature becomes more of us, and that's what we present to people around us. And we can't do that outside of the power of God. There's not one thing we can do to change ourselves. Can't do it. We can in our flesh and our humanity, but it's not going to last. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get mad. You're going to get angry. Not only at yourself, but people around you. You got to ask God. You got to ask God, and He will do the changing. And He'll do a good job, too. Because once He does it, it's done. Amen? All right, so the perfect law of liberty is this first fundamental nature. All right, and what that is, it, is which is, it's our rights to look into the mirror of who God says I am through Christ. We have liberty when we look at who Christ is. We read today, Ron read today, that he was completely submitted to the Father. Can you imagine God becoming man and, and you know, and, and coming to the earth, born in a manger, he wasn't born in a super great hospital, you know, didn't have all the bells and whistles of a prince being born on the earth. He was born in a manger. And a shepherd came to visit him. It's an amazing thing, you know? But we take on the mind of Christ. Why? Because he is completely committed and submitted to the Father's plan in our lives. That's important. We all want things done our way. You know, we have to learn to say, not my way, God, but your way, God. That's the, that's the struggle. That's the, the balance, you know, okay? So this mirror that we look at reflects back to us the truth about what my privileges and my rights are and what your privileges and your rights are according to Christ. And he had the liberty to what? To, to believe this word. He was the word, not only the spoken word, but the living word. And we have that same privilege. When we get into a snag or in a bind, you know, we take a, a healthy diet of this every day. You eat every day, right? Because you get hungry. This is a steady diet of who God says you are in Christ. It's all about Christ. It's not about us. Hard to believe, but it's about who Christ is. And why he came to the earth is to save you and me. And then what do we do? We present the gospel for people. It's really not that complicated, all right? Because we have this great liberty, we know the second perfect law or the nature of God, and that's the perfect law of love. The perfect law of love that, that was on the cross as he was crucified and as he was dying, looked at the very people that put him there, and he looked and he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. The perfect law of love. All of us are sinners. All of us deserve to be on that cross. All of us put Christ on that cross. You understand that? Our sins put him there. Past, present, and future. 
And because he took on all of our sins, past, present, and future, it's not an issue of sin anymore. It's the issue of what a relationship with the one that God sent to save us, and that's Christ. You know, I, I don't want a religious atmosphere in this church. You shouldn't have it in your lives. Submit yourselves and ask God to help you to become more like him. And he'll work that process in you. But you have, we have to spend time with them. There's no shortcuts here. You know, you have to spend time with them. You got to get on your knees. You got to pray. You just, just give yourself over to him. Even when you can't. We'll talk about this in the second portion of my message here. It's a struggle sometimes. All right. So I am a doer of the work because of continuing steadfastly in the what in the in the age of his truth in the gauge of his truth. That means I believe what he says. I just don't. It's not just something I hear and read. I believe it, and it, it, it it's internalized in me. It changes me from the inside out because it's his truth. It's not my truth. It's not the truth that the world would give me or you know or show me. In shows and I mean there's all sorts of truth that the world comes at us with and say, Oh, that sounds good. Wow, that might work. But that's what it is. It's it's a counterfeit of God's truth. Satan is very active in every part of the world in communication. He 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 goes for little kids, he goes for a little bit older kids, he goes for even older kids. You know what I mean? He's trying to stop us. He's trying to stop us from what? From just simply following who Jesus is and following in his footsteps. So to be a doer has its roots in me accepting myself in love. That's a hard thing. Sometimes I can be so hard on myself. I can get so on myself that I, I just don't love myself. And God says, love yourself like I love you. You know that great book by Pastor Stephen. It's just like God love you. It's an amazing thing. Once I understand that I can, I can only love him by the truth in this book, by the way. You know, what he says about me, not what I think about myself, but what he says, the way he looks at us. It's, it's revolutionary. It goes beyond psychiatry. It goes beyond the, the, the wisdom of the world. It's an amazing thing. So because of accepting myself in God's love, now I can fulfill the royal law of love which is loving others as I love myself. God loves me. I understand this. And I see it. Now I can love myself the way God loves me. And now I can love people around me. It's, it's the royal law of love. It's an amazing thing. But there are, you know, as Christians, we, uh, we live in cycles. You know, you ever, you ever get a scratch on an old record? I don't know if you guys even remember these things, but the records would get scratches and they would go around and go boop, butt back and they would recycle. You hear the whole thing over and over again on a record. Well, we could fall into cycles of just doubting. You know, you just don't believe it. You don't believe it, even though it says it. You don't believe it. Not only about, the, about this book, but about things in the world. You have doubt. All right, and then you have fears. You're afraid. You're afraid you might be timid. You might be afraid to, to apply for a new job. You might be afraid to, to just speak up for Christ. But the Holy Spirit can give you that boldness. All right? And you have cycles of what? Of just uh, feelings of intense atmosphere. Of what you, I mean, it, it grows on you. The more you get outside of this book and this word, this word here, the more the world comes into your thinking. And now here comes the here comes those cycles, because that's all you have to fall on. You know the mind responds to the heart. If you fill the mind, if you fill the mind with the word, you take on the mind of Christ. What happens? You start to fill your heart and your soul with thoughts and things of God. You learn the truth about who. God says you are, and you build walls of protection around who you are. So when the devil comes at you and the world comes at you, you have this defense mechanism. You start to think with God. You, you think the way he does. You don't think the way the world, you don't, it doesn't matter. I Think about this. If you've ever stood up for Christ, whether you're witnessing or just in your everyday life, you mention his name and you're attacked. 
That's the devil using the, the tongue and the and the mouth and the larynx of that person to try to discourage you. That person might not even know what they're saying, but they're being used by the Peter was used that way, by the way. Here he was, Christ says, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to and he says, No, you can't do that. You can't no, we're not gonna let you die. And and he says, Satan get thee behind me. He said this to Peter, who was a disciple, gonna be an apostle. Why? Because Peter allowed his his larynx to be used by the devil to try to discourage Jesus Christ. So don't you think that he'll use people to try to discourage you? It's common. We went soul winning yesterday. Ron knocked, left something at the door and the lady came out and boom, she, she attacked him. It's common, you know? I had I had a little, my feathers ruffled a little bit and a person that I talked to, but you know what? We need to understand, it's expected because we have the truth, we have the message for people, you know? We give them the truth in love. We're just the messengers. You ever heard the, the saying, don't kill the messenger? Well, that might happen sometimes. You know, there are martyrs all over the world that give their lives because they say, I believe in Christ and I am a Christian. All right. Think about this. There are Christians who live in cycles of doubts, and we talked about that. Remember when Jesus was on the boat and they were facing a great storm? While he was on that boat and sleeping quite well, he wasn't disturbed by the turmoil in the atmosphere. His disciples were going nuts. They're trying to shovel water out of this boat. And he's like sleeping. You know, he's, he's sleeping. And they're trying to get the water out of the boat. You know. That's like Satan. All right. That's like Satan trying to accuse. But how many of us live in the pressure of what we think? That's an interesting thought. Outside of what God thinks. Instead of living in the perfect liberty of fulfilling the perfect law of love. No matter what you're going through, ask God the Holy Spirit to reveal his love through you to people around you. They won't understand it. It could be an attack against you. It could be you're going through turmoil, you're going through something. But ask God to let his love flow through you and into that situation and towards that person. That person's life will be touched. They won't even understand it, but they will be touched. Because it's not you, it's God in you touching that situation and touching that person. You, that's where you learn to trust God. You learn to walk by faith because you don't know the outcome of it, but you're trusting God in the midst of it. All right? So knowing God's thoughts of peace will, will fill the atmosphere we live in. And... Uh, I've been very quiet this week. My wife will attest to that. That's unusual sometimes. You know, I'm, I'm, she gives me that frown. Okay? Uh, maybe she doesn't think I'm so quiet. Uh, but, you know, when, you, when you're looking for direction in your life, I tend to be quiet. I tend to get quiet with God and pray and ask for direction, no matter what it is. That there's a change coming. Um, I don't know. So have you ever heard, I mean, I've told you this before. If I, if God has a direction for you, knock on that door. See if that door opens. And give him the what? Give him the, the right to veto your choice. Hey, I want this job, God. I want to go here, God. And I ask him. And if he closes the door, then he closes the door. See, I give him the veto right to close that door or to open that door. And uh, so when you're going through times of decision, that's when you draw even closer to God and you, and you get quiet and you really you listen for him. According to the word, you listen for him according to, according to the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. So we all go through these things. All right. So we are no longer under this government of emotional tension or the lust of men created by Satan. And that's what Satan does. He creates these moments of anxiety. He gets you. He, it's like a top spinning. When it's spinning nice and true, what happens? It stands like this. The second it starts to slow up, it starts to wobble. And eventually it falls down. That's Satan's job. That's what he's trying to do to you and me in our lives. He's trying to get us off that, that, that constant spin of what? Taking on the mind of Christ. And Satan accuses from morning to night. You realize that? 
Can you imagine if you lived in a house or you lived at work, no matter what it is, and you're being accused day and night? You know, I've been guilty of that, and I've had it come my way. We have to be careful. There's no accusing. Christ doesn't, he never accused anybody. He never had any accusations. God doesn't accuse. You know, we have to be careful not to be accusers. That's Satan's uh, modus operandi, right? So there's a battle and tension, all right, that's present. But our privilege today is to live in the authority that's given by God according to his word this morning and to live by what it says. That's today in that liberty. All right, the second part of my message here, there will be times in our life of, of every believer, you and I and others, when we will not be able to hold on to faith or to rise to the promises. You know, there's 5,000, there's a lot of promises, 5,730 or something like that. And, and they're all for us, they're all yay and amen. But we have trouble sometimes not looking them up when we're going through things and asking and claiming those promises to get through those situations, to be encouraged in what we're going through. Joshua 3.11 says this, Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Isn't that amazing? The ark of the covenant. All right. This doesn't mean that yeah, we will deny truth when we're struggling. All right? We'll be unable at times to experience the undeniable truth for a period of time. We live in doubt because we aren't trusting the Word of God. We're not going to the Word, so we live in doubt. You know? That's our humanity, you know, not running to God, not looking in the Word for direction and comfort, but we, we rely on our own understanding and we get ourselves in trouble. We fall into doubt. We want to rise up to these promises. We try because we know we're supposed to, right? Aren't we supposed to believe the promises of God? Yes. Huh? Are we supposed to look them up? Aren't we supposed to ask God to and say, God, can I claim this for me? In this situation, can I claim this promise and say, this is mine? You know, we're supposed to, but sometimes we don't. All right? Sometimes, no matter how hard we try to stay in one place, and try to believe, but the promises seem unattainable. We just have got these moments of unbelief. And we struggle. We struggle in our walks. God understands that. All right? But listen, the children of Israel, they could not hold on to faith. And when they couldn't, they had one thing going for them. And I just want to talk about this Ark of the Covenant, right? It was represented in the Ark. This thing they carried around, you know? And only certain people could touch it. People that tried to touch it and weren't supposed to, they were zapped. God took them out. It might seem harsh, but only certain people were allowed to touch this ark. So this ark, the thing that killed the Philistines, this ark, there was power. You ever see the, the uh, ark of the Ra or lost Raiders the lost of the ark, ark or whatever it was? Yeah, yeah that thing. All right, and the, and the, the idea that Germans said there's power in that ark, and they thought they could take over the world. But see, they didn't understand that was God's power in that ark, power for good, not for evil. They had it all backwards, but they're chasing this thing. All right, so the ark was present when they what when they crossed the Jordan River. You know, the priests went ahead. They, and they, they walked ahead and the waters parted. So you had the waters that parted the Red Sea and the waters parted in the Jordan River. This is amazing. He bring them into the promised land. Two miracles. Of these, these, this is the second generation that saw this. It's an amazing thing. The ark was present when they brought down the walls of Jericho. All right? Think about that. Joshua meets God. He, falls flat on his face, he says, all right, you're going to take Jericho over. So he gave them specific directions that they marched around the first day. They didn't say a word. Didn't say a word. They marched around. They did it for six days. And the seventh, I mean, they, the, the trumpets blasted, but they didn't speak anything until the seventh day. And then when he said, let her go, and they all did, you know, the walls fell in. These walls are thick. People live inside the walls. 
It's not like, like this wall. This is a wall probably as wide as this room. All right, and people lived inside the wall. Amazing. And these walls fell in, which is an amazing thing in itself. It's miraculous, you know? So it was all about the ark, all right? It represents more than the golden lampstand. This is what was in it. The table of showbread and the altar of incense. It represents who God is, all right? And grace through a covenant. He had a promise, a covenant with the Old Testament believers, and he has it, he has one with the New Testament believers. And it's signed, sealed, and delivered by the blood that was shed on Calvary through Jesus Christ, all right? So God cannot betray himself. That's the truth. He must honor his own covenant. So he set it forth, and he has established it. He can't violate it. So the truth that's in this book is going to happen. It's going to happen in, in his time, his way. So he's set it forth. He's established it. And he cannot violate it. He cannot be satisfied with the covenant breakers. That's when we break the covenant. He's not satisfied with the covenant breakers, but he will what? He is satisfied with his covenant. He will never deny himself, even when we deny it. Isn't that amazing? Wrap yourself around that. You know, when you can't, he can. When you won't, he will. It's just the way it is. Because he has the overall plan. He knows the whole plan. And he wants us to be a part of it. I want you to understand something. One of the things I, in, in the timing of Christ's second coming is that he wants us to understand that in the thousand year reign, we're going to be co-reigning with him. We're going to be judging the, uh, the angels. We're going to be co-reigning with him during the millennial reign. So are you ready to reign? Are you ready to, to be a leader? over a city, over a country in that thousand year period? Think about it. Think about all the all the little squabbles that we have with ourselves and each other. But we are going to co-reign with Christ. He's trying to teach us how to be what? How to be leaders in Christ. Alright? So he must honor his own covenant. He has set it forth and he has established it. He cannot be satisfied with covenant breakers, but he will be satisfied with his covenant. Alright? So when he accuses you, the accuser of the brethren, we know who that is. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. It says this, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of Christ, of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. Isn't that amazing? This is Satan he's talking about. And the deceiver of the whole world. In Revelation 12, 9, the, one, the verse before that, it says that the great dragon was cast out. And the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Isn't that amazing? Lies, and, and he lies and accuses, but we have an ark of testimony. That's what we have backing us up, all right? It's that Jesus Christ satisfied the justice of God, even as we were experiencing weakness. When we are weak, he is strong. When you can't, he can. Remember what I said? When, when your will says no, his will says his will will carry through. Because he has the ultimate plan, the ultimate outcome of it. And he wants you and I to be a part of that. Don't run away from that. Engage in it. I was talking to Ron yesterday about our company has this, this program called Engage. All right? So that means from the, you know, from the very high up to me, below, to the very people who are doing the, the, you know, the, the labor. You have to engage. You have to communicate. You have to listen to them, get feedback, you know. You got to hear the good and the bad. Are, are you really a good supervisor? Are you really a good manager? Are you you got to engage. You got to hear the truth. You know, some people will complain. That's not what I'm talking about. Some people have good points. And that's what you engage about. So you can make the place a better place to work in, you know. 
So this is this thing that God wants with us. He wants us to engage with him. He wants us to engage with him in studying and praying. Why? Because he has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life. If we deny him, he abides faithful and cannot deny himself. Isn't that amazing? 2 Timothy 2.13. Here's that verse. If we believe not, yet he abided faithful. Who abides faithful? Christ abides faithful. He can't deny himself. He cannot deny himself. That was 2 Timothy 2.13. So be, because of God's covenant... We are accepted even when we are in complete weakness. I love that. When I can't, he can. When I say, when my will is no, he says my, his will will come true. You know? Jesus is a, an amazing example for us. Whatever he went through, whatever he went through, he, he never accused and he always asked the Father for help and for direction and for strength. And we can do the same thing. All right, the last part of my message, all right, and we're going to look at the, um, we're going to look at who we look on to to be encouraged. In Hebrews 12, 2, turn there with me. Looking onto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the beginning and the end of our very lives. He knows that he knows he remembers the first breath we took when we were born. He knows the last breath we're gonna take. So that's why that's why the issues of death are what? Are God's. We don't know. And that's why we pray for people. Alright? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross? What do you think that joy was? You know what that joy was? It was you and me. He was looking at the very people that he knew he was dying for. And he endured the cross, despising the shame. And is set down at the right, where is he? He's set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And he prays for us day and night, non-ceasing. So the devil has a program to get us to be what? Undiscerning and to get us to be not under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He wants us not to think with God. He wants us to get distracted and scattered in our thinking and, and how we deal with things, how we take care of things every single day, all right? The devil programs people to be religious instead of living in a mystery of faith, you know? You know, last week we only had a handful of people here. This week we got, we got quite a few more, you know? God just, just continues to speak to my, my heart how faithful people are. People can and people can't come, but God's still faithful. There are reasons for it. There are reasons why people weren't here last week. But I was encouraged in spite of that. You know why? Because there's two of us here, right? And we're two or more gathered in his name. I'd love to see your faces this morning smiling. I mean, I am very encouraged today. All right? And I'm blessed that you're all in here. All right? So... Satan programs people to be religious instead of living in the mystery of faith, right? So what is faith? Remember? Substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That means that our lives, not everything, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen in a week. You know? God has put things on my heart. I, I, I look forward to it. But even today. Even today, and I don't know what today is going to reveal to me, but I have to trust God. I have to understand that he is faithful, and I can trust him. So this leads to critical and judgmental spirits, okay? Others, he programs in spiritual sens sensuality, which means you have to feel Christ to believe you are filled. I've been in churches where, you know, if... If you're not dropping down because, you know what I mean, and you're not speaking certain languages, you know, that's the feeling of it. And that's not what it's all about. It's not what, what spirituality is all about. Spirituality is your walk with God, your personal walk with Him, you know. And, and we celebrate together when we, like that song service this morning was amazing. I don't know if you sense God's presence here. You know, God is really really given us an anointed song leader 
I was just telling him, I don't want his head's not going to get too big here. You know? But I want you to understand, it's not just that he's, he's doing a great job, but I can sense the presence of God when he's up there and he's leading us in song. It prepares us for this moment here where you're receiving the word of God. There's a difference there. We talked yesterday about that. Some churches have the big hurrah, you know, they have all the, the visual aids and they have the big bands, on, you know, that's great. But I hope that God's presence is there and people understand they have that, that special relationship with him when they're there. And I'm sure some, some churches do, a lot of them do. We're not unique here, all right? But that's, that's the thing, the relationship with you and the relationship with God, all right? Empiricism, this word is to believe that what you feel is real and the basis of your experience. If I don't, can't touch it, I don't believe in it. You know what I'm saying? If I don't feel good, you know, it's not right. You know, it's, it's totally with the world. It's a counterfeit of what God is talking about. So that system is repudiated by God. So love is the foundation of our faith to give us spiritual senses and to discernment in the mind of Christ. And that's, it's, it's very, very important. It'll keep you out of trouble. When you go through your day, when you're walking through the course of the day and you ask God for direction, you ask him to give him your eyes, all right, and his mind as you're dealing with people, as you're walking, as you're talking with people, as you, as you work, as you perform your job, you know, as you have conversations with people. You'll sense the difference because of the people around you. He wants us to be totally in love with ourselves through Christ to fulfill what his program. All right? You understand that? Don't allow your mind, your emotions, your religion, all right, or your success of what happened yesterday to interfere with the progress he has for today. God will give us amazing, amazing victories every single day. They could be very small. They could be very small, but they can be encouraging, you know? Um, he doesn't want us to block what he can do today because of yesterday's victory. You know, yesterday is gone, but there's today with God, and there's tomorrow with God. Look forward to those victories, all right? So live in the program of the presence of, you know, the eternal is. You know, we live in today. We live in who God is today in our lives. So don't look back, but look onto Jesus without looking at what, without looking at yourselves. Jesus will bring every single person to a place of His desire when our hearts are open to travel and take on the journey His way. That's the crutch, you know. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. John fourteen six. It doesn't say. It doesn't say Paul is the way. Paul, is, you see what I'm saying? Put your name in there. No, he says he is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. Right? And he wants to be on that journey with you, and he wants to be on that journey with me. But we have to give ourselves to him. And it's a daily thing. When the Bible says take up your cross daily, that's what that's talking about. What am I going to give up for God today? The whole day or part of the day? Some of the day? You understand what I'm saying? Because we get pretty, pretty busy and pretty, pretty distracted every single day, all right? So the reason is, is because he has a calling for you. He has a calling for me. He has a place for you. And he wants you to experience the truth while you travel with him. It's an amazing thing when, when the word of God becomes real to you. It's not just something you read. But it's something that you believe, and then it becomes an experience in your day-to-day -day life. It, it, it fulfills you. It completes you. Yesterday, when we were talking to different people, I talked to one man and his two sons, you know? And I, I you know, he, he took a track, and he was, what I, what I saw God doing is that he was, he was listening. He was ready to receive, and that's what he did. Then his two boys came out of the house. One of them was wearing a Patriot shirt. You know? That was a direct connection for me because I'm a Patriots fan, you know. Um, but the, the thing was, it was God's timing in that moment. It was just, it was an amazing time. 
And all I could do was what? Not share about Paul Paradis, but share about Jesus Christ. You know? And they were listening and they took the tracks. And the boys wanted a track, so I gave them a track and talked to them a little bit about, you know, because it says, how do you get to heaven? Well, there's seven questions. And I said, you know, this is a real test now. Because there's only one right answer, not according to what that piece of paper says, but according to what the word says, God's word says about it. And uh, and I invited them to come, and maybe someday they will come. Uh, but God is faithful, isn't he? He's faithful with the things that we do for him and with him. All right. So if you think you must feel spiritual, do something to be spiritual. You know, it's it's not correct. We've missed the importance of who we are through what he has done. It's what Christ has done in our lives. And he's done for the people in the world. So finish with this one last statement, all right? Just only look onto who Jesus Christ is today. He's the author. He's the finisher of your faith. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you've done it all ahead of us. Thank God that we can trust that process, God. Help us, Lord, to, to surrender ourselves to you and to completely give ourselves to you every single day and in everything that we do. Just like Lot in it, with his nephew. I mean, just like Abraham and Lot, his nephew. He said, if you go left, I'll go right. If you go east, I'll go west. So we, we give you that choice, God. Which way do you want us to go? We don't want our way, but we want your way. That's the right way. So God, bless us this week. Watch over us. Provide for us, Lord. Provide in our health. Provide, Lord, a, a time for, that we can just surrender. Time to spend with you in prayer and studying the word, God. And just encourage us this week. Bless our families. Watch over our families. Provide for them. And God, meet every need that we have. Not what we want, but every need that we that we have and we ask of you. Bless us, we ask in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.